on ATV World, it's time for a roundup of all the day's top stories. Stay tuned for the late news. Good evening. More than 30 people have been shot dead and 18 others injured by a teen gunman who went on a killing spree in the South Australian state of Tasmania. The gunman opened fire at a tourist resort at the historic site of Port Arthur. Children, tourists and local workers were among the victims singled out by the man as he started shooting in a crowded restaurant before moving outside. According to police, the gunman, aged around 19 and armed with a high-profile rifle, is holding three hostages at a tourist lodge near the site and is negotiating with authorities. A powerful bomb blast in the Pakistani province of Lahore has killed more than 66 people and injured dozens more. So far, no one has claimed responsibility for the attack, which ripped through a crowded bus traveling from the capital of Lahore. The attack comes on the eve of the, Mu of the Muslim festival Eid al Adha and was apparently aimed at causing maximum civilian casualties. The Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto has condemned the attack. The Correctional Services Department is joining forces with police to fight attacks against prisons. The department now confirms that last night's firebombing in a staff car park is linked to two other recent violent incidents. Peter Williams reports. A car being used by a Stanley prison officer burst into flames last night while parked outside CSD residential quarters. Firemen found a tin of paint thinner under the vehicle. The incident follows lorries being driven into gatehouses at Stanley Prison and Siulam Psychiatric Centre in the past 10 days. The attackers are believed to be protesting against the treatment of inmates. CSD officials may have been hoping that the attacks on their facilities were isolated incidents, but last night's arson case may have proved that they are facing a more organised and formidable foe. The Correctional Services Commissioner Raymond Lai confirmed the incidents are part of a campaign and vows to fight it. He said an intelligence unit will be formed with police and security strengthened to cover staff quarters as well as prisons. These uh, publicity-seeking criminal acts are designed to undermine law and order and should be interpreted in this light. The Legislative Council's security panel is seeking an early meeting with CSD officials about the attacks. Legislator Emily Lau, a member of the panel, says Hong Kong is not used to such intolerable acts of violence. In the final months of colonial rule, there has always been a concern about possible breakdown in law and order. And uh, right now we see such blatant challenge to the authorities. It must be, you know, something of concern to many members of the community. So it is something that has to be addressed head on. Ms Lau says she frequently received complaints from inmates about prison treatment, but urged them to take their grievances through the proper channels. Lychee Cock Prison, meantime, remains in a high state of alert following the suspicious death of an inmate this morning. The 26-year-old man was found bloodied and beaten in his cell. Tensions are running high at the Lychee Cock Prison following the beating death of an inmate early this morning. Police say the 26-year-old man was found unconscious in his cell before 8 a.m. He was covered in bruises and blood and died on the way to hospital. We believe that uh, there may be a gang fight uh, happened last night uh, inside the ward and um, the deceased uh, prisoner was uh, 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 maybe uh, made dead out of the uh, gang fight. It's the latest in a string of violence that has erupted in Hong Kong's overcrowded jails. Earlier this month, two Vietnamese inmates at Stanley Prison were beaten by a mob. It was an apparent retaliation for an alleged stabbing of several Chinese prisoners by several Vietnamese convicts that same week. As the weather heats up, summers will continue flocking to local beaches. But with the warmer temperatures comes the threat of shark attacks. Several beaches in the territory are now equipped with shark nets to guard against the attacks. But as Rahina De Luna reports, those nets may be giving swimmers a false sense of security. This woman was one of three people last year who were victims of shark attacks. The tragedies and several purported shark sightings last summer prompted the urban and regional councils to install more shark nets at popular swimming areas. It's been two years since the first nets at beaches on Clearwater Bay and Silver Strand were put up. Up close, the nets show signs of wear, with some minor tearing. 
This diver who's been keeping an eye on the net says their condition is worse than last year. He also showed how easy it is to lift the nets, allowing bigger fish to pass through. But the regional council maintains the nets are able to keep away sharks. Four additional shark nets have just been installed in Cyclone beaches and more are on the way. The urban and regional councils have earmarked nearly $80 million to install nets at 23 beaches in the territory. A woman remains in fair condition in hospital tonight after she and her husband were hit by a van. The 38-year-old mother was pinned under the vehicle and had to be rescued by fire services. The accident happened on New Clearwater Bay Road. Authorities say a van ran from behind was forced onto the pavement, plowing down the four family members. The 51-year-old father was treated but was later discharged, while the two toddlers are being kept under observation at the United Christian Hospital. Indonesians are mourning the sudden death of their first lady, Siti Harnita Suhartu. She was 72. She let her husband have most of the spotlight, preferring to play a role behind the scenes in the Suharto family. Married for nearly half a century to the leader of Indonesia, she supported her husband through nearly 30 years as president of the world's fourth most populous country with the world's largest Muslim population. Coincidentally, she died on the Muslim holiday for sacrifice, Idul Adha. Many in Indonesia, this was a sign of the kind of life she led. She headed organizations for women, cultural and civic groups. She and her husband have six children and 11 grandchildren. She exerted much influence on her family and was viewed as a balanced force against criticism about the family's business concerns. Her body will be flown to her hometown of Sulu and will be buried within 24 hours of her death. The Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres arrived in Washington today for talks on military cooperation on an implementation of the ceasefire accord with Hezbollah guerrillas. Mr. Perez has been facing accusations that Israel's 16-day offensive was politically motivated. Not surprisingly, Shimon Peres bristled at charges that there may have been domestic political considerations behind his decision to launch Israel's major anti-Hezbollah offensive. Even before the operation was over, the Israeli Prime Minister turned on its head the question on how it might affect his immediate future. Will it help? Or will it harm? Who knows? Who really does it? It is rather an intervention in our elections by the parties that don't want to have peace. The Hamas and Jad and Hezbollah, they try to intervene with bombs and cuts. Next month's general election may indeed not have inspired the unleashing of Israel's military might. But the effect of the terms to end the 16-day operation was clearly part of such calculations. We would never uh, launch a military operation that risk the life of individuals in order to improve our education in the ballot, but uh, I believe that ultimately the very proof of uh, uh, readiness uh, to go ahead with the use of force where, where it is uh, ultimately needed uh, will uh, strengthen the government. The U.S. mediator, who tirelessly shuttled between Jerusalem and Damascus, had no doubt about the merits of the agreement he secured. It's not uh, the permanent solution. It's not a peace treaty, but it's a very big step forward and no one should underestimate it. Throughout the operation, Paris had the support of a huge majority of Israelis. A consensus eroded neither by the terrible deaths of Lebanese civilians sheltering in a UN compound, nor by the failure of the Israeli military machine and the Katusha rocketing of northern Israel right up to the ceasefire. But now the opposition charges Paris settled for a bad deal. He succumbed to Syrian pressure, claims the Likud leader. This is bound to escalate. We'll have to go after Hezbollah. Uh, they'll hide in the villages, we'll have to sort them out, then they'll attack our villages, and we're right back where we started from. I'm afraid none of the major goals that the government set for itself have been achieved. Tens of thousands of Lebanese refugees, meantime, continue to stream back to their homes in southern Lebanon following the ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah guerrillas. More than 150 people, most Lebanese, died in the fighting.
The rush home began within hours of the cross-border ceasefire coming into effect. A constant stream of traffic heading to South Lebanon. The refugees using the same route that had been under gunfire only hours before. There were some smiles aboard the thousands of trucks and cars, but not for very long. They soon discovered the extent of the damage. Huge bomb craters slowed down the flow of vehicles. People prayed that their homes were still standing after more than two weeks of Israeli attacks. But first, they had to navigate the many obstacles of war. Some village communities were completely cut off by the damage to roads. In desperation, many families abandoned their vehicles and reached their properties by foot, a long trek across difficult terrain. Communities were reunited amid the ruins. On the outskirts of Nabatir, where Hezbollah is strong, government workers began to repair broken power lines, one of the first priorities. Hezbollah supporters hoisted a banner condemning the American back peace plan. But the guerrillas translate the new understanding between themselves and the Israelis as a victory for their resistance. Israel was unable to destroy one Katusha rocket launcher, says this Hezbollah sheikh. That shows Shimon Peres, who was victorious. For the returning refugees, there may be calm now, but South Lebanon remains a war zone, the place where Lebanon's resistance to Israel's occupation goes on. Two separatist groups from Kashmir and the Punjab are claiming responsibility for yesterday's bus bomb attack, which killed 15 people in India's Uttar Pradesh state. Heavily armed police, meanwhile, are guarding polling places after voting began in the country's month-long general elections. From the poorest citizens to a Maharaja, India's voters turned out early, stood patiently in the heat, and cast their votes. The calm in sharp contrast to a costly campaign. At stake, the 500-plus seats of the Indian Parliament, the Lok Sabha, or House of the People, a house very much in turmoil these days. A massive corruption scandal has tainted virtually every political party. The old political dynasties are crumbling. The election results likely to be the most confused in decades. Ironically, the political mess comes just as the Indian economy is on a roll. A sizable and growing middle class finally getting a taste of prosperity. The ruling party campaign urged voters, stay with us, we'll all get rich. But many aren't buying it. More than half the population still lives in desperate poverty. The economic gains are not trickling down. These politicians have done nothing for us. All the political leaders are corrupt. We need a change. Many are trying to capitalize on that anger. Hindu fundamentalists have strengthened their position, promising a return to traditional values. So have the communists, promising equality for the poor. Polls indicate no party will win a clear majority, which could bring in a weak government that won't last long. And though that prospect disturbs voters already struggling with too many candidates on one ballot, the right to vote is still serious business here. However disgruntled, Indians are not going to relinquish their title as the world's largest democracy. More than two million Muslims from around the world chanted prayers and verses from the Quran as their annual pilgrimage called Hajj drew to a close. The pilgrims gathered at the Grand Mosque at Mecca in Saudi Arabia. All Muslims are expected to make the holy pilgrimage at least once in their lives. The official statistics show that more than one million Islamic faithful travel to Saudi Arabia from abroad, joining almost a million more from Saudi Arabia. The countdown to the Atlantic Games has begun with the start of the Olympic torch rally from Los Angeles. The relay, which will cost 20 million U.S. dollars to stage, is the longest torch run in history. The lighting of the Olympic flame was a ceremony honoring history and heroes. Olympic decathlon champion Rafer Johnson, who was the first African American to open an Olympic ceremony back in 1984, was today the first runner among thousands in the torch relay. More than half the torchbearers were nominated by friends and family, chosen for their extraordinary service to their community. Men and women who saved lives, built schools and shelters, who trained weeks before this big event. The youngest, 13-year-old Glenn Smith, works with the homeless. The oldest, 96-year-old Frank Kelly, volunteered for the United Way. He raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for them in the last 25 years. He will be part of the longest Olympic torch run in history. Costing $20 million, this relay will also be one of the most commercial. 
with runners, once called the heralds of peace, now heralding products for corporate sponsors. The money goes towards sponsoring community heroes like Frank Kelly. In fact, he says he plans to run again at the next Olympic relay when he will be 100 years old. And finally, a look at tomorrow's weather. Expect another sunny day with temperatures reaching a high of 28 degrees. That's all from the ATV Newsroom. Good night.